Hello, I'm Lino Camprovi, and I'm co-editing a book called La Sociedad Entre Pandemias, which is published by Fundación Gaspar Casal. We are gathering around 30 chapters with a collective reflection from many different disciplines, ranging from epidemiology and public health to sociology, history, economics, philosophy, and it's basically to see what kind of challenges has the COVID pandemics exposed and how to face them. As part of that effort, I have today the immense pleasure and also very special honor of hosting an interview to Professor Lorraine Daston. Anyone basically who has had an interest in history and epistemology of science knows who Professor Daston is. She tackles big philosophical issues Mm, objects, objectivity, evidence, chance, mm, observation, wonders, phenomena. She, she tackles those big issues and approaches them historically, asking how they came to be, who pushed them, and what were their trajectories, let's say. And originally her focus is the early modern period but you can easily find her writing brilliant books and articles or giving very elegant talks in topics like 19th century cloud perception or cold war rationality and many many others she has of course also written about the covid pandemics she's many other things but for me as for dozens of others was she's First and foremost is director of Department 2 of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, which is a position she held, I think, from 1994 to 2019, and from which she basically shaped the entire discipline, and for the better, I think. And most importantly, she uh, invited many people to help her shape her, shape the discipline and through very, very lively conversations and engaging debates. So I was um, lucky enough to be there for three years, for which, Rainy, I thank you deeply. And I also, of course, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Lino. With me to interview Lorraine Daston is Sebastian Dutreil, who is actually a colleague and friend that I made at the Department 2 of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. He has written extensively on Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis and the Earth System Sciences, looking uh, in particularly at, for instance, how geochemistry and biology interact and share ideas and methods. He asks how, what can we get to know about the Anthropocene and how can we get to know it. And as part of that effort, he has also published on COVID-19. So Sebastian, thank you also very much for being here. He has prepared a list of very deep and thorough questions, which he's going to use as a guide for which otherwise is intended to be an informal conversation. So. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pino, and thank you, Rainy, also. Uh, so the, for the introduction, my first question will be about the uh, role of history of science and what history of science can tell us about the, the epidemic. I mean, we've heard um, epidemiologists talking about variables dealing with the spread of the disease, uh, economist weighing uh, the cost of such and such political strategy and other disciplines with their own stance on the epidemics. What can history of science and perhaps also the, the specific kind of history of science which you have contributed to develop, namely historical epistemology, so what can this discipline uh, tell us about the epidemics? So first of all, I have to say what a pleasure it is to be once again in conversation with two alumni of Department 2 uh, it feels like a bit of the intellectual collective, which I now miss quite a bit. Um, the question that you asked, Sebastian, is one which I'd like to answer from the standpoint of historical epistemology, which is the study of the deepest categories of thought, um, like cause and responsibility, and to look at how categories of thinking about natural catastrophes, like an outbreak of an epidemic, but perhaps also an earthquake, 
um, or a volcanic eruption um, have shifted um, a la longue durée, so over, over centuries. Um, when the plague broke out in Europe in the late, in the mid 14th century, um, it reaches Florence around 1348, um, there are a number of causes that are put forward by the learned and also, of course, by um, theologians. Some of them are astrological um, and they have to do with ill-starred conjunctions. Some of them are medical, which have to do with miasmas, putrid air, the corruption, um, especially of waste in the cities, and some are theological, which have to do not so much with individual sin and um, responsibility, but rather the responsibility of rulers. This is very a very typical late medieval, um, early modern pattern of explanation for natural catastrophes, which are seen less as targeted punishment for communities, but rather as a check upon otherwise uncontrolled royal power. What we see in the course of the 18th century, and this is a pattern of explanation which continues well into um, the late 20th century, is a shift from um, a combination of blame and cause to cause and randomness. So the view is that um, misfortunes like the outbreak of a plague or an earthquake are in the final analysis, a matter of physical causes which have no moral meaning. They are genuine misfortunes. And one can epitomize this contrast with what happened in the 1980s, for example, um, when an environmental crisis involving the contamination of water in the American state of New York with PVC, this was seen as a matter for blame of the corporation responsible versus the eruption of Mount St. Helens, a volcano in the Pacific Northwest, um, upon which occasion the New York Times wrote, terrible as it is in terms of the loss of life and property, at least no one is responsible. What one now sees in terms of the pattern of explanation, and this did not begin with the current pandemic, but probably with Hurricane Katrina, is an ever diminishing role of causes beyond human control and an ever greater role of human responsibility and blame. No one seriously believes that um, the American political class was responsible for creating a hurricane, but they were certainly held responsible for the extraordinary damage wrought in cities like New Orleans by Hurricane Katrina by a policy of long-term neglect of the dikes. Similarly, with regard to the pandemic, we see a language which is increasingly a language of blame and responsibility in its most extreme form, um, Donald Trump's tirades against China's responsibility. So what historical epistemology can contribute is to make us conscious of the shifting frameworks of explanation. Epidemics caused by the close proximity of human beings and animals have probably been a feature of human existence since the beginning of time. But the idea that blame can be assigned is a relatively recent phenomenon, not unconnected, as I said, with a much expanded notion of human responsibility and human culpability. Thank you very much. This, this, the question of, of responsibility and of the cause of the epidemic is uh, very interesting. And I think it, it has been very interestingly, these issues have been inter interestingly mixed uh, in the various uh, papers uh, that have uh, said that uh, 
the um, virus and the epidemics were uh, to be sort of as a revenge of nature. Um, and this is uh, an idea and a notion of on which uh, you have um, um, written and worked a lot, especially um, articulating the uh, I, uh, articulating the idea that uh, one can extract uh, norms uh, out uh, of uh, natural phenomena. So uh, I would like to hear you a little bit more uh, about this idea of the revenge of nature and its relation on the normative authority of nature and the way the responsibility uh, are then uh, attributed. The revenge of nature is a trope which is invoked in very specific situations. Uh, it's invoked when there is some combination of a natural disaster, an avalanche in the Alps, a flood in uh, Northern Europe, uh, a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, where there is some element of human culpability. Let me give you an example. Um, a hurricane or an earthquake, which hits parts, let's take an earthquake because it's an easier comparison, an earthquake of a given seismic magnitude, say 7.5 on the Richter scale, so a big earthquake, which hits Tehran and Los Angeles, will do very different amounts of damage to life and property because of different building codes, different densities of settlement patterns, um, different protocols for emergency notification and emergency relief. Um, although no one believes that the earthquake is caused by human agency, its effects can be exacerbated often by a factor of 10 or 100 by human action or failure to act. So, for example, the corrupt officials in Tehran or Istanbul um, who did not enforce the building codes. Um, that's the situation in which the revenge of nature is invoked. Um, the revenge of nature is not invoked when an avalanche occurs in the Swiss Alps. But if the avalanche occurs in a region which has been cleared of trees to make more ski runs, then the, re the revenge of nature is invoked. Perhaps the most striking example in recent experience is what happened in Japan in 2011. Um, an earthquake, an offshore earthquake, caused a tsunami which cost at least 15,000 lives and also created an emergency situation at the nuclear reactor at Fukushima. It is characteristic of our current way of thinking about the revenge of nature that that entire catastrophe was epitomized as Fukushima by the single word Fukushima, even though Fukushima cost perhaps a, th a thousandth of the number of lives that the tsunami did. And the revenge of nature was taken to be um, a slap in the face of those who would build nuclear reactors on seismically unstable ground. That is, the revenge of nature concentrates on the one aspect of that triple catastrophe for which one could reasonably point a finger to human responsibility. And don't you think that, um, so, so you say that um, there was a shift uh, when we uh, abandoned um, a theological explanation for a natural catastrophe and one, one important uh, theological explanation, as you've argued uh, in, in some uh, work, um, rests on the idea that there is, there is an equilibrium of nature, in nature and um, a natural catastrophe may emerge when um, humanity sort of put this equilibrium out of balance. I wonder whether the you, you, you thought there was some reminiscence of these theological explanations in uh, nowadays attribution of the virus as an, a revenge of nature. Um, 
I mean, I, I have the feeling that this idea that we are um, perhaps the, the principal cause when we have shifted um, ecological equilibrium regarding bats' habitat and, and other uh, wild animals um, is, is highly reminiscent of this ecological uh, idea of a revenge of nature, which was exemplified in uh, Linnaeus' work. So what, what is your... Um, uh, stay, um, what is your take on, on, on this? Don't you think there's a difference between this and the revenge of nature, as you explained it just before? You know, I, I think that um, it's absolutely apt to invoke Linnaeus's idea of the nemesis divina, which is this capsizing of the equilibrium of nature um, in the context of some explanations, particularly those of environmentalists. Um, of the pandemic. Um, so the idea being that in very densely populated areas, for example, the city of Wuhan, um, human beings are encroaching upon territory which previously had been the habitat of wild animals like bats. Um, it, it certainly is an idea about equilibrium um, and the disturbance of you. But note that it's always in the direction of placing blame upon human agency mm -hmm. rather than the other environmental actors. So one could, if one were to take mm -hmm. um, a much more Latourian view and include non-human actors in this scenario, um, one might want to think about as an ecologist would think, of the entire ecosystem around Wuhan, in which not only the one species out of many is jostling with many other species for an ecological niche, but many other species are, comp are competing with the bats, for example. Um, and the focus on human responsibility here is where this idea of capsized equilibrium, which could equally well apply to an ecosystem in which there were no human actors. For example, you might imagine invasive species, which um, completely overturns the, the equilibrium of a particular ecosystem, um, but rather instead to focus on the agency of human beings. And it's only, no one would talk about the revenge of nature on the poor bats. Um, it's only when human beings are involved. It's a kind of perverse anthropocentrism in which instead of glorifying, exalting our central place in nature, we, um, we assume upon ourselves a kind of monomaniacal responsibility for all that happens in nature. So I do think there is a relationship, but I think that it differs slightly from Linnaeus's version or an ecologist version in that um, human beings are still being given a perversely central position in the drama. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, I'd like now to come back to um, uh, my general question on the world of history of science and more particularly on, on the production of knowledge about the epidemics and perhaps a comparison between uh, the way knowledge is produced uh, today and the way it was produced, say, in the 17th century. So, so the current production of knowledge about the virus uh, involves many kinds of individuals and profession, nurses, medical practitioners, um, virologists, epidemiologists, uh, etc. It also involves material places and apparatuses such as uh, hospitals, smartphone, smartphone application, test centers, and so on and so forth. And it also involves institutions uh, such as national academies of science, uh, private companies working on vaccines, uh, etc. So, so could you tell us um, here a bit more uh, about the economy of knowledge production in the 17th century? Who uh, were the people who actively participated in the production of knowledge? What were the chains of uh, observation? What were the material locations in which uh, knowledge was produced? Um, yes, this kind of question. So what one sees in the course of the 16th and 17th century is um, a massive reevaluation of the value of what were then called the mechanical arts. So the liberal arts, 
um, the trivium and the quadrivium, so grammar, rhetoric, logic, music, astronomy, arithmetic, and geometry, constituted the core of the medieval university curriculum and were accorded very high prestige. These were liberal arts. The mechanical arts, which included everything from farming to blacksmithing to cooking to the distillation of liquor, liqueurs and medicines, um, the mechanical arts were of relatively low prestige. And what one sees in the course of the 16th and 17th century is an enormous boost in the prestige of the mechanical arts as a source of genuine knowledge. Um, and one way of thinking about this is that courts, the princely courts, which are in competition with one another, often in military, but also in cultural competition with one another, um, value this kind of know-how. Know they value the skills of a military engineer who can build fortifications around a city, but they also value the skills of a goldsmith who can craft exquisite filigree um, salt cellars like Benvenito Cellini and um, did for Francois Premier um, at Fontainebleau. Um, so one, one begins to have um, a reevaluation of who can be someone who produces knowledge, um, which spreads from the mechanical arts to even people who would have been considered um, not even artisans at the time. Francis Bacon, when he is talking about sources of knowledge, says that we even have to pay attention to herbalists and old wives, um, people really at the very bottom of the social scale, who may have observed the healing virtues of certain plants and minerals. Um, when Bacon is writing about in the 1620s about how to reform natural philosophy, how to reform science, he takes as his, his paragon of what knowledge could be, progressive knowledge could be, to be with the mechanical arts. He says, the three things which make the modern age, his own age, superior to um, the ancient world are the printing press, gunpowder, and the magnetic compass. He chooses as his frontispiece a ship in full sail sailing beyond the pillars of Hercules, that is the Strait of Gibraltar, into the Atlantic Ocean um, to suggest that it's the skills of navigators, especially, of course, in his own day, these would have been Portuguese and Spanish navigators, who have been able to leave the protected basin of the Mediterranean Sea and sail the high seas of the Atlantic Oceans, the discovery of the Americas. So um, these sites of knowledge could be anywhere. They could be on board a ship. They could be in a farmer's field. They could be in an apothecary's shop. They could be in a printer's workshop. They could have been in a gunnery foundry. These are all sources, new sources of knowledge and it's not, for that reason, surprising that someone like Galileo, whom we associate with um, some of the most spectacular contributions to the rational science of mechanics in the early 17th century, hung out in the shipping arsenal of Venice, where ships were made. There was a lot to learn there. Thank you very much for um, this enlightenment. Um, um, pursuing on on the uh, on the, the production of knowledge and what made um, knowledge authoritative, I, I would be interested to hear you uh, on another aspect. So you have um, written an important book with Peter Gallison, tra tracing the history of objectivity. Uh, which is one of the central values when it comes to the production of authoritative knowledge. And um, in this book, you've shown uh, how very different epistemic ideals, uh, such as truth to nature, 
um, mechanical objectivity and trained judgment emerge historically and how they shape different kinds of scientific self. So um, I wonder here whether one could uh, identify and trace different kinds of epistemic ideals and scientific self in the contemporary rivalry for the construction of uh, authoritative knowledge. Um, so I'll just elaborate briefly here. So claims of new knowledge about the uh, coronavirus were made outside standard institutional circuits of authoritative knowledge, uh, be it free rider doctors uh, broadcasting their own views on YouTube channels or uh, lay persons advocating such and such, such and such, such and such remedy on blogs. Um, and um, some have argued that in a state of uncertainty, that tends to be a political polarization of science. For instance, if Trump says that hydroxychloroquine uh, is a remedy or treatment for uh, the virus, then his supporters will marshal evidences in this direction. Um, but I would be interested here in hearing you uh, on the construction of authoritative knowledge beyond their institutional origin. So when it comes to the production and circulation of new facts and informations uh, in such circumstances, uh, what do you think is the role played uh, by epistemic ideals and uh, certain qualities uh, of scientific self vis-a-vis -vis other aspects such as sociology of networks and institutions? Um, it's a very interesting question and it's all the more interesting because I think we're at a moment now not caused by the pandemic, but certainly um, intensified by the pandemic, at which the sources of scientific authority are shifting. Um, and let me explain what I mean. Um, you emphasized that the sources of authority have been largely institutional, and I entirely agree with you. Um, one way of thinking about the entire development of science really since the mid 18th century and the foundation, even the late 17th century and the foundation of academies is the creation of structures which, which certify knowledge as being authoritative. Um, and we could trace that history from uh, the commissions of the Academie Royale des Sciences, um, which received inventions or memoirs on scientific and mathematical issues and reported on their quality to the current peer review system, for example. Um, what's happening now, um, in part because of um, the, the, the digital revolution, is, and in part because of the new funding structures or the, the comparatively new funding structures of science, is um, the cult of celebrity. So what existed from the late 17th century through really, I think, um, the 1990s was a view about um, disciplinary control and disciplinary certification. And this took the form of educational certification. It, it took the form of um, hiring practices, it took the form of peer review, it took the form of um, competitive uh, procedures to publish in the best journals, it took the form of recognition, most famously the Nobel Prizes. What you begin to see in the 1990s is an attempt to go over the heads of the disciplinary gatekeepers mm -hmm. to the public directly. Um, this is in part because in most industrialized nations, the great bulk of funding for scientific research comes from public funds. And therefore, it seemed not only logical, but also right that the public understand the science that it was, after all, financing. Um, in certain competitive situations, the United States is perhaps the most vivid example where you have projects competing with one another. So for example, the superconducting super collider of the elementary particle physicists versus the human genome project of the geneticists um, 
there were enormous stakes and one way to reach a larger public and of course through the larger public congress was to go directly to the public um, to gain the ear of prominent journalists at the New York Times and elsewhere to highlight one's own work. So that what had previously been seen as um, a, a, almost a disqualification in expert circles, which is to write for a popular audience in science, became increasingly prestigious within science. Add to that the cult of um, social media celebrity, and you have a powerful alliance that is wrenching authority from the traditional institutions and mechanisms designed to vet scientists. And you see this even within the scientific community itself during the pandemic in the often heated discussions about what should be published when. So the debate between those who thought in an emergency situation, we ought to be able simply to post results, even very preliminary results, results which have not gone through randomized clinical trials, results which have not gone through peer review on some internet archive like MedArchive, and others saying this is undermining the credibility of science because um, it's only to be expected that at least 50% of these results will turn out to be entirely unfounded. So you have a, a very intense and sometimes acrimonious debate which takes um, sometimes the form of fast versus slow science, as it were, going on even within the scientific community. Um, and then outside the scientific community, there is now a license for those who, for whatever reason, consider themselves to be mavericks or renegades or outside of the inner circles of the scientific community to publicize their claims without having to run the gauntlet of peer review and the other checks of scientific disciplines. It's, it's very interesting to, to hear that answer and especially to have a step back beyond the um, more easy answer about the importance of social media such as uh, Twitter and YouTube, which are more recent. I mean, um, going further to the uh, um, the way uh, science is funded uh, as uh, a principal source of explanation for contemporary mechanism is extremely interesting. Um, perhaps uh, one question um, uh, on another aspect, which is uh, not so much on the um, um, production of knowledge itself, but on the way um, the, the epidemics has been handled politically. Um, a central discourse has underpinned the political choices uh, to handle the contemporary epidemics, which was basically to oppose um, money and uh, the life of the citizens. So the discourse rests on the tension between the continuation of the economy and measures to protect the population from the disease. And as um, is the case for most contemporary economical discourses, uh, the economy is here uh, centered on macroeconomic indicators, such as uh, gross, domestic, gross domestic product uh, or economic growth, rather than on material conditions of subsistence and the possibility to find food, shelters, healthy conditions. And uh, historians of economy uh, have argued that the disconnection between economical discourses uh, on the one hand and materiality on the other is relatively recent uh, in the history of ideas. So my question will here uh, be twofold. Um, first, so in times of plagues or other past epidemics, how, if at all, was handled a similar tension between economic imperatives uh, and the spread of epidemics and how in these cases did the relation to material conditions of existence differ 
uh, from past discourses to contemporary ones? So, first of all, um, the assessment of value would have been gauged according to somewhat different criteria. So, as you say, um, the way in which contemporary economists assess economic well-being, prosperity, um, is almost entirely um, due to index numbers which are compiled from macroeconomic data. Um, and it's been a longstanding criticism of these, these index numbers that they systematically overlook those parts of the economy which are essential, highly valuable, but not often monetized. So, for example, the labor of women in the home mm -hmm. for a very long time. I mean, the economy would grind to a halt right now if women just went on strike. Um, but it, um, with the fact that they're not salaried workers, or if they are salaried workers, their salaries are extremely low, um, means that this the, the value of their contribution simply does not show up in the index numbers. Um, the same might be said for the what are called in in the United States essential workers. Um, in German, they're called System Relevante Arbeiter. I don't know what they're called in French and Spanish, um, but they, these is the class of people who were discovered in the pandemic. Because although their, their contributions don't show up in gross domestic product and other macroscopic indices because they're so poorly paid, um, it became absolutely clear that were they to stop working, everything was, would stop working. They were the, peop the only people really who had to keep working aside from the medical staff during the pandemic. Um, so one has to think very hard about the disjunction between economic indices of value and what we might call um, real life indices of value. In a pre-modern context, before there were any statistics that could be used as the basis for macroeconomic um, indicators, um, forms of value, although not always proportional to what one might call the necessities um, of life, um, would nonetheless have had a much closer relationship often um, to what actually kept a community going. Um, this is not to say that the people for example, women in the home or farmers in their fields um, were necessarily granted um, either the income or prestige which they deserved. But there was a much stronger sense of how central they were to the whole. That's the first observation I would make. Um, the second observation I would make is that um, eco the economic costs of an epidemic depend a great deal on how one's economy is organized and also what institutions are in place to take care of people who are either um, sickened by the plague or who are impoverished by the plague. Um, particularly in Islamic societies, in the Middle East and in North Africa in the Middle Ages, um, there were very well endowed hospitals that took care of the sick and the poor, most famously in Cairo, but also elsewhere. Um, and there were similar institutions in much of Italy so, for example, when the plague broke out in Florence in 1348, there were institutions on the ground that would care for not only the sick and the stricken, but also those who were perhaps entirely impoverished um, as, as a result. So 
although we tend to think of we tend to we tend to falsely identify um, pre-modern societies with modern subsistence societies in which people li live hand to mouth, one has to look very, very carefully at what we would now call the social welfare network in these societies, which could have been quite densely woven in some pre-modern societies. So when we talk about the slogan, your money or your life, with regard to the current pandemic, um, that has to be framed within whose money, is money the only index of value, and what are the alternatives to individuals earning money? Um, and I think we can see even in the contrast between um, the policies of many European nations, for example, which have some form of furlough program, some form of um, part-time work support versus many parts of the United States and elsewhere where such programs do not exist, um, the difference in terms of economic impact on a felt daily basis. So uh, continuing on, on the um political handle uh, of the epidemics, um, the, the, the various way in which the epidemics was handled in different countries uh, have given rise to countless analysis taking back uh, Foucault uh, ideas of biopolitics. And um, we can indeed be struck um, when reading the pages of Discipline and Punish dedicated to plague by the many resemblances between the way the plague was handled uh, and the most extreme forms of uh, contemporary lockdowns, for instance, in China. And yet, since um, times of plague, new knowledge and new apparatuses of biopower have emerged. Uh, hospitals, uh, computational epidemiology, the discovery of germs and viruses, the conceptualization of homogeneous social categories within larger populations, statistics, uh, and the history of which uh, you've worked yourself, so how do you analyze the effect that these discoveries and new apparatuses have had on the production of knowledge and on the political handling of the epidemics? I think one of the most interesting effects of the pandemic has been in some cases to reify categories which might otherwise have been within the biomedical sciences, at least, in the process of dissolution. Um, and the most obvious of these is race. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sebastian, you may be familiar with the stance of many French biomedical researchers who have criticized their American colleagues mm -hmm. for using race as a dependent variable in studies, for example, of blood pressure, of the effects of certain forms of medication, um, et cetera. Um, the stance of the French biomedical researchers being, this is a social construct. Yeah. Um, this is a figment of a malevolent political imagination and has no place in biomedical research. The stance of their American colleagues is, it may be a social contra construct, but it's a social construct with real effects on real people's lives, at least in certain social situations. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the heart of how you collect statistics. Um, in the United States, statistics are being collected on the differential mortality, morbidity and mortality rates um, among African Americans, for example, who contract COVID-19 versus the white population. Um, whether or not these categories actually have traction is a highly contested issue, but the more statistics which are gathered within these, the firmer the rubrics themselves become.
as a basis for comparison. Um, so without taking sides in this debate between the French and the American biomedical researchers, you can see how the pandemic is contributing to solidifying some statistical rubrics as homogeneous reference classes rather than others. So you could imagine, for example, um, and I'm now making this up, but one could imagine a French biomedical researcher looking at these statistics and saying, actually, what I would really like to do, I'm just going to stratify these by income level. Um, we are going to completely omit the rubric of race or ethnic background and simply look at income level and see what the outcomes are. Depending on the choices that you make about those kinds of rubrics, um, you are going to get um, perhaps very interesting and different results. It's impossible to predict until the studies are done what the results might be, and certainly very different policy implications. Can I jump in, Sebastian? Yes, sure. It's basically, uh, Rainy, to push you a little bit on the direction that, of the last question. Uh, there is um, there is now a controversy, right, between people who call for a general lockdown and people or, or doctors that call for more specific measures targeting risk groups. Uh, this second group accuses the first group of, which is basically the common sense, or it has been the common sense for the last six months, general lockdown. They accuse them or, of being medieval, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> of going back to medieval which, measures. Which is true, but it's not which necessarily an insult, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and I was, but I was reading also David Edger, who, well, actually not reading, I, I was listening to a talk by him who Uh, used his idea of the shock of the old to understand current politics of how to handle the pandemics. He said, well, now we have, we are in the era of, of telematic medicine, we are in the era of statistic, uh, high tech in hospitals, what have you, but at the end of the day, <laughs> we are using confinement, which is what people have been using for centuries. But I think that Sebastian was, was asking you, But it's, is it really the same, right? How has it changed? Yeah. The name is the same, quarantine, but are the mechanisms uh, not forcing us to actually accept that we are facing a different kind of animal? I, I don't know. I put that question. Right. So th that's, that's a really good point, Lino. Um, it, what quarantine might have meant in the 14th century in northern Italy is quite different from what it meant... Um, for example, in New York or Berlin in 2020. Um, uh, it was never the case in any of those cities that there was a serious disruption of um, food supplies, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, never the case that the city was actually walled off. Um, You could, you could close the city gates of a medieval walled, walled city um, to all travelers. Um, you can have borders closed, but it's not the same as um, a walled, claustrated um, medieval city. Um, nor is it the case that people were sealed within their houses um, for an indefinite period of time. Um, so the, 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 the word quarantine, you're right, covers a multitude of arrangements and therefore very different experiences of those who undergo it. Um, also, I should say, um, we should think about what quarantine originally meant. It meant 40 days. So 40 days um, of being locked in and locked up. Um, whereas I think um, almost no one now, even those who are recommending so-called circuit breakers in the United Kingdom, um, believes that this is going to last for 40 days. Um, these are much more punctual, strategic um, in interventions. But 
to the larger issue that you raise, which is the shock of the old. Um, when, when we are confronted with an absolute novelty, it's not surprising, I think, that we recur to those methods that however old and however crude they may be, we nonetheless know work. So that that I think that I think should 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 surprise no one. I think what has happened, and that's the reason why there's controversy now, is that there has been an extremely steep curve, learning curve, about the nature of the virus and its patterns of contagion. So the question is, do we now know enough to fine tune these relatively crude mechanisms, which affect everyone, and um, use more uh, surgically precise interventions? Um, and I think, I think this is a matter where reasonable people could differ. Um, I don't know what the situation is in Spain and in France, but in Germany, there is uh, just today, for example, the courts overturned a ban on people traveling from one of the German states to another and spending the night in a hotel because there was insufficient evidence that this was a major engine of spreading contagion. So there, there is a constant discussion going on between the state of knowledge and the state of particular actions. Um, and I don't think that should be surprising um, because the state of knowledge is evolving so quickly. Things we might have believed in the middle of March, we no longer believe. So for example, um, you may remember the sudden sale of gallons of disinfectant um, I think now people are much less afraid of contamination by surfaces than they are of person-to-person -person contamination, which has made a difference in terms of the measures recommended. I have a last question on um, precisely on this link between uh, how much we know about the virus and uh, how do we uh, act in response uh, with the addition uh, of a comparison of catastrophes, so to say. So let me explain. Many have uh, analyzed the current epidemic in the light of climate change, uh, often to take the, the former uh, as a general rehearsal uh, of the latter. And one, I mean, I, I, was struck by, I was struck by the difference between the two when it comes to the links between action and knowledge. I mean, climate change is perhaps one of the most, one of the best documented fact in the world history of science. And to say the least, the political action has really lagged behind the knowledge. And by contrast, we knew barely, we knew nothing of this virus less than one year ago. Uh, and uh, in the, the midst of this shaky knowledge, um, radical, political act, radical political actions were taken. So as a historian of science, how do you analyze such discrepancies uh, regarding the positivist model according to which action should follow from knowledge? What an acute question. Um, there's no doubt but that um, first the evidence about climate change is overwhelming. You're absolutely right. We, we have um, enormous amounts of knowledge about climate change is both its causes and its probable consequences in comparison to what we know about the coronavirus, the new coronavirus. Um, and also Everything we know suggests that the consequences will be far more cataclysmic than those of the current pandemic. And I think the only answer I have to what you rightly pose as a, as a puzzle is twofold. Um, first, obviously, the structural changes that will be necessary to combat climate change, which are so far reaching and so pervasive 
um, that they have encountered enormous, very well-funded, very powerful resistance. Um, it may be that in the long run, should it turn out that there is no effective vaccine mm -hmm. for this new coronavirus, that those measures may also be um, long-term and far-reaching, but as yet, there's no reason to think that. So that's the first contrast between the two cases. The second is simply temporality. Um, I think that the structure of the event, so the event as a temporally circumscribed explosion into consciousness that suddenly rivets the attention of all versus a long-term, and really long-term, we're talking now about a scale of decades and centuries, process, which is, although very well documented, visible, for example, in the wildfires of California and Australia, the increasing number and intensity of hurricanes in the Caribbean, lots of other such um, evidence, nonetheless unfolds on a scale of time which is much more difficult to package into the punctual structure of the event makes it much harder to mobilize action. Um, the very notion of an emergency is something which is temporally located, circumscribed, and requires immediate and decisive action, and then it stops. Whereas the phenomenon of climate change is as pervasive as the climate itself and unfolding on a scale which is a transgenerational scale, which makes it, I think, much harder, however urgent you think it is, to mobilize action. As I'm listening to you, Rainy, I but coming up with, uh, with one last question on my part, which is, uh, it is not exactly what we have been discussing right now, but uh, since this is for a book, which is a general reflection on what is to be expected, and since you have been uh, involved with active collective research for many, many years, do you see any trends in research patterns, particularly in the humanities or even in the public intellectual conversation? Do, do you see any trends that you have seen developing in the last years being maybe multiplied or, or catalyzed by the COVID pandemics? Maybe it's too early to say, but I don't know if you're if you're getting my question. It's very different from what we right. No. Yeah, we have talk, been talking about politics yeah. and sociology. I'm I'm now asking about a more much more specific thing that that uh, concerns us, but of course the society at large. Yeah. No, I I think I, I perhaps I could take as my cue Sebastian's last question, which is perhaps. One trend in the humanities that might be amplified by this experience and exactly the contrast that Sebastian just drew between our response to the pandemic and our response to climate change in terms of decisive political action um, is the role of the humanities and expanding our imagination. Let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. Um, during the Cold War, the cataclysm that focused people's imaginations was that of nuclear war and nuclear Armageddon, basically the destruction of um, humanity and perhaps much, much of the planet through um, a nuclear conflagration between the USSR and um, the United States. And the most effective weapon that the forces of disarmament had were novels and films. Um, it was imagining 
what the world would be like the day after a nuclear war that galvanized ordinary citizens into protest against ever larger nuclear arsenals. Um, and although I do see the dangers of creating a cataclysmic imagination, which resonates all too loudly with Judeo-Christian visions of the apocalypse, um, <laughs> I, I can certainly see a role for the humanities in understanding the politics of the imagination, of the collective imagination in galvanizing political action. I think it has been a great disappointment for the scientists, especially those who are working directly on climate change, that their predictions, their sober predictions about what is going to happen if action is not taken immediately, have basically had zero effect. <laughs> um, and the time, I think, has come to think about what would have effect. And if the analogy with the nuclear disarmament movement of the 1960s and 70s is any guide, then it is the study of the imagination, the collective imagination. Thank you very much. Sebastian, anything to add? Mm, no. Okay, we are about an hour long, so this was exactly what we intended for. Thank you, thank you very much, Rainy, for the answers. And this was a pleasure. And thanks, Sebastian, for, for the questions, of course. Well, Thank you both for the questions. It was a delight to talk with you both. And I hope to see you sometime, both of you, as my students say, IRL in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. It would be a great pleasure indeed, yes. Yeah. Okay.